Oh boy, this is going to be so much fun because we're ready to start stocks. Exciting stocks. Sexy stocks. Risky stocks. <laughs> we start with a popular email that was circulated about the internet in about 2002 or so. If you had invested $1,000 in Nortel Network stock last year, you would now have $50. 95% down. If you had purchased $1,000 of Budweiser beer, drank the beer, and returned the cans, you'd have $78. So our stock tip for today is to start drinking heavily. In 2009, this same email was circulating, but instead of Nortel Networks, it was AIG or Citigroup. And now, pretty soon, we should start to see the same joke circulating around, but instead it'll be First Republic Bank. <laughs> Folks, you know, it's capitalism. <laughs> Nothing's perfect. A history of booms and busts and booms and busts. And wouldn't it be nice if we could get it right? And no, no we're humans. We're, we're not perfect. Slide number two. Slide number two. Okay, whoops, what happened? <laughs> Twice. Look, folks, stocks represent ownership in a corporation. Stocks is really a bad name. Businesses, I think, is what they really should be called. I like the Spanish word, acciones, you know, like actions. <laughs> stocks are equity financing, uh, meaning we're, we're, equity is a fancy word for ownership, whereas bonds are loans, are debt financing. That's our next chapter. Why do corporations issue stocks? Well, they use it to raise money or start a business to help pay for ongoing business expenses and as a way to gain prestige and respect within the industrial community because once you become large enough, it's just expected that you're going to become a public corporation. Not all do. Some of the Largest companies in the world are private, but not too many. You might have heard of M&M's, Mars candy bars, Snickers, yeah. And there's another company called Cargill where you, you consume their products. And But most companies, once they get large enough, become um, public because the folks who started the corporation become instant multimillionaires, multi-billionaires in some cases. Yeah. And the corporation does not have to repay the money, unlike a bond, which is a loan where you have to pay the interest and principal. But now the corporation is a public entity, which means it has certain responsibilities that private companies and private uh, uh, enterprises don't have. So it's a two-edged sword here, right? You're public now. Why do investors purchase stock? Well, you share in the success of the corporation. If the company does well, you do well. If the company doesn't do well, oh well. Although, also, unlike a, 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 a regular business called a sole proprietorship or a partnership, you are part owner, but your liability is limited only to what you've invested. So you bought one share at $100 and the company goes bankrupt, pff, you lose your $100. But they can't come back after you and say, oh, you know what? The corporation owed all this money. No, it's called limited liability. And there are some people who try to, uh, uh, you know, game the system and try to take advantage of it. One of them was a, the previous guy president. But, uh, but no, for the most part, the system has worked fairly well and it's increased our standard of living and made many, many people wealthy because we get income from dividends optionally. You can think of them like interest payments, but they are distributions of the earnings. They're optional, but some companies have been paying dividends for 100 years. And what most people key on is the capital gains, the dollar appreciation. Did the stock value go up? Well, if the company did well, the stock price should follow. It's not always perfect. And in fact, some corporations go down the porcelain oasis and you lose all your money. So that is called the total return, the dividends plus the capital gains. Now, some people will say, oh, 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 you get an increased value when the stock splits. No, 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 no. It's an accounting maneuver. There's no increased value from stock splits. If you had one share at $100, now you have two shares. But the value dropped in half. Sound like a question on one of the assignments? Yes, it is. If you split the stock two for one, this price has to drop in half 
because there's no increased value. Um, Warren Buffett of Berkshire Hathaway fame, he's a famous investor, has refused to split his stock since its inception. A single share now goes for, oh, it's, it's up to almost $500,000. At least it was last time I checked. So it's well over $400,000. That sounds ridiculous. But no, it's true. If Coca-Cola or, 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 or McDonald's or any of these companies that have been around for decades, Johnson & Johnson, if they had never split their stock, one share would be hundreds of thousands of dollars. And there's a reason why they split the shares. They just don't want it to get too expensive and look too outrageously formidable. But that's not a big deal because many brokerage firms will let you buy fractional shares. I don't know how much they charge for that, but it's a service. And So if you want to buy $10,000 worth of Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, you can. You don't have to buy a whole share at $489,000 or whatever the current price is. Historical. What are the historical returns? Well, stocks have returned 8 to 10%. That's what we tell people. Actually, some have done better. Some have done a whole lot worse. But in any one year, is it ever 8, 9, 10%? Very, very rarely. It's usually 17, minus 12, 4, 22. Yeah, it, it, the variance, the deviation is very large. And stockholders used to expect 4 to 6% in dividends. Half of that return was from dividends. That was as much or often more than bonds returned in interest and stocks were considered much riskier than bonds. Not anymore. Although we're going to see at least a couple stocks that are paying 4, 5, 6%. But most stocks are now paying about 2%. Some are paying less. 2 to 3% is typical for large companies. And the whole, as a, as a whole, now some companies don't pay any dividends. So as a whole, the stock market is paying less than 2%. But hey, savings accounts are, so they're coming up. They're, some savings accounts are coming up, but still are still paying you know, half a percent or you know, one or 2% if you're lucky. Um, and this has led some experts in the industry to claim that we're in a stock market bubble. Are we? Well, the, a lot of the air blew out of the market in 2022, and there's still people who think that uh, it's going to crash and burn. And you know what? I love it when people say that. That's that's music to my ears because <laughs> because when it's so bizarre. You go back in time and you hear when people are really worried and saying horrible things about the market. That usually means it's going to go up. When they're saying wonderful things about the market and 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 we're all going to get rich, that's when it's usually going to go down. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, let's listen to famed investor Peter Lynch. If stocks are the best long-term financial investment, how come they're considered so risky? Well, for two decades after the crash of 1929, stocks were regarded as gambling by a majority of the population. This impression wasn't fully revised until late 1960s when stocks once again were embraced as investments. But in an overvalued market that made most stocks very risky. Historically, stocks are embraced as investments and dismissed as gambles in routine and circular fashion, and usually at the wrong times. Stocks are most likely to be accepted as prudent at the moment they're not. And Peter Lynch called it his cocktail party theory. He was a money manager at a mutual fund company, very famous uh, money manager. And he'd be at a party and he'd say, uh, oh, you know, what are you? you know, I'm a doctor. You meet somebody. You know, I'm an architect. What are you? I'm a money manager. And they all move away from him. <laughs> he said, okay, it's time to buy. And then he go to another party and he'd say, what are you? Oh, I'm a lawyer. What are you? A money manager. And they'd say, oh, really? Um, well, do you have any uh, tips on what to buy? And he thought, okay, stocks are fairly valued. And then he'd go to a month. <laughs> he'd go to a, 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 a party. And what are you, an engineer? What are you, a money manager? Oh, really? Oh, my goodness. Well, you know what? I just bought this stock my buddy told me about. I don't know what it does. I, I don't even know its name. But he gave me the ticker symbol, and it's supposed to double. And then he knew the market was going to crash. <laughs> and the market would crash, and then everybody would stay away from him. It was like clockwork. We are not rational individuals. We're humans. We're emotional. And that's the problem with stocks. Emotions can take its toll. Let's take a look at rolling 10-year periods. Try to bring some perspective into the picture. Here is the Great Depression. 
And if you put a thousand dollars or whatever, hundred bucks or whatever, ten years later, you had lost money. But coming out of the Great Great Depression and World War II, we saw that stocks moved in two directions, up and way up, until finally you were getting 10-year returns of almost 20%. And what did you hear people say? Ooh, 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 is it too late to get in? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because that was the 1950s, right? Technology, science, the atomic age, modern day ago, Go and what happened? The baby boom generation came of age at the same time that stocks were wildly overvalued. And we had Watergate and Vietnam and the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement and the gay rights movement and disco, which, you know, you might not think was, it was a big deal, folks. But mostly what was the problem was the stocks were overexpensed or were, over, were over sold, overbought, as is, is the saying you'll hear. They were expensive. And the baby boom generation came of age and they all needed refrigerators and cars and houses and jobs and shoes and it was a very difficult time for the market and you saw almost 10 year returns that were negative but they just barely touched uh, zero and what did you hear people say it was a brutal bear market 73 74 72 73 ooh is it too late to get out and when you hear that yes the answer is yes it's Now's the time to be buying because sure enough, we come back and and stocks were very inexpensive in the seventies, and then and then we had uh, new technology, computers, microcomputers, uh, telecommunications, the internet, and stocks moved in two directions, up and way up, and you had ten year returns of almost twenty percent. And what did you hear people say? Y two K, blue skies, productivity gains. Is it too late to get in? Yeah, it's too late to get in. The internet bubble burst, the housing bubble burst, and sure enough, you, we have the Great Recession. You have to go back to the Great Depression to see rolling 10-year periods where the market was negative. And, of course, what did you people say? Is it too late to get out? Yeah, it's too late to get out. And look, we're coming back. Now, are we going to do the exact same thing? I don't know. I don't think so. But uh, that's why they call it the future. The key is to have a long-term perspective and realize, you know, assuming you don't need the money anytime soon, if you have 10 years or so to invest, realize that if the world does end, if there's no food at the Vons, there's no gas at the Chevron station, there's no clothes at the Gap, and the cell phones aren't working, and, and the utility companies aren't pumping out gas and electric, and, and the trash isn't being picked up, and the sewers are backed up, and the hospitals and the schools and the and the and the and the and the, and the uh, banks and the and the and the fire departments and the fire the police department they're all shuttered and it doesn't matter where your money is, dear students. Failure is not an option. In fact, the next 20, 30 years, I'm very optimistic economically as an investment, uh, 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 as an investor. I'm worried politically. I'm worried that we're going to blow ourselves up, start World War III, die in our own waste, um, tsunami, earthquake, meteorite, disco returning. Any one of many things could destroy our world, but I'm very optimistic. As we said right at the beginning of the semester, right? I'm very optimistic. So we'll see what happens. That's why they call it the future. Now, what are the risks? Okay, we talked about the good news, right? And we talked about the risks. Let's talk about the risks more in detail. The company could fail. The market, you know, the, 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 the market for the stock could quickly evaporate. Nobody wants to buy it. And you're left holding the bag. And you buy it for $11.88 and sell it for $0.30. Cents. Has, have... Do you know anybody who's ever done that? I know somebody. I've known him all my life. He's kind of a goofy guy. He teaches at Southwestern Co. It was a really good stock, folks. It was based here in San Diego, and they were going to make artificial blood. And, you know, you the blood banks are always asking for people to donate blood, and then they have to test it for HIV and, 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 and hepatitis B. And, and, and if you make artificial blood, that all goes away. But do you notice that the blood banks are still asking for people? It didn't work. It didn't work. Anyway, uh, the market as a whole could, no, will plummet. We don't know when. We do know in the past it's happened. It's probably going to happen in the future. And then there's global investment risk, sometimes called foreign risk. 
most other countries simply don't have the same standards of accounting as the United States. But that's changed. Many company, countries have better standards than the United States now. And the world is global. I know you got people screaming about the global elites and everything, but there's only one world, folks. <laughs> we don't have two worlds. Um, you hear about the third world and the second world. The first. There's one world. And we better learn to live with each other, and we better raise the standard of living of people all around the world, because if we don't, we're all going to perish. In my humble opinion, you decide. Uh, liquidity risk is a risk of not being able to sell your stock. This is not usually a problem as long as you stay with real companies. You hear the, hear the term bona fide companies or going concerns. You know, companies many of you never heard of, but many of you have, many of them you have. It is a problem with these sham companies called penny stocks. And there's some examples on the website you can take a look at. Just stay far away from these things. If someone tells you, oh, this thing is seven cents, it's going to go to 70 cents, just stay away. Don't get involved. You're going to get screwed. It's, it's just it's the way that it's part of, the, part of the, the ecosystem is that there are sham corporations out there ready to take your money and people who have no scruples whatsoever. Mom was in the White House just recently. Reducing the risk of stocks. How do we reduce the risk of stocks? Well, risk is difficult to measure. No, return is easy to measure. How much did you start with? How much did you end with? But risk is impossible. It's even more difficult to anticipate. We have some measures, but none of them are perfect, and we learn about them in detail in the Introduction to Investments class. Emphasizing large company stocks, which pay consistently rising dividends, has been one of the best strategies for reducing risk. Diversification is another major strategy for reducing risk. We have what's called the five stock rule of thumb. You, um, you, you buy five stocks, okay? And you, you diversify and you do your research and, and typically one will do poorly and make you sad. Three will do about average, they'll follow the market and one will explode and make you very happy. And you know what, this has been my experience. It's called the Better, Inve Better Investing. It's a wonderful organization that we discuss more in detail in the Introduction to Investments class. And, and if you're at all interested in, in investing, you really want to join their group. Time is the last and best major strategy because over time, our global economy has, has, has uh, risen, our standard of living has risen exponentially and is rising around the world, which is a very good thing. And stocks, because they're corporations, because they're businesses that provide the services and the goods that we need to survive, have done very, very well for investors. How about the scams? Well, we started mentioning these things. It certainly has not helped the cause of stock investing, that there are many, many scams out there ready to take your money. One of the oldest and still most prevalent is called pump and dump. The scam artists pump up the price of a stock, usually a penny stock. It's hard to do it with big companies. Rumors, lies, innuendos, email, now uh, text messages and and chats and WhatsApp and all titter or bitter or whatever it's called. Yeah, uh, uh, sick sock. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Well, however they can communicate with you. And the buzz dries up the stock price. The scammers dump their shares at a large profit and the price plummets when the suckers realize they've been taken. Folks, this is nothing new. It's been going on for hundreds of years. It's usually re reserved for these sham penny stocks, so just stay away from these things. And you'll see some examples on the website. Occasionally, investors get caught up in what are called stock market bubbles, manias. The dot-com bubble was the latest stock market bubble. Many people think that, that we're in a bubble right now, or we were in a bubble, but I agree for some stocks, but not for others. There's been, there have been some stocks... Uh, you might have heard of Stitch Fix and Roblox and some of these other, you know, really exciting technology stocks that didn't do as well as they thought they were going to do. In the 1970s, early 1970s, late 1960s, there was the Nifty 50. These were stocks you didn't have to worry about buying. Doesn't matter how price, how big the price went up. You might have heard of Avon <laughs> and uh, and Xerox and and uh, Polaroid. Polaroid. Uh, the name still lives on, but the company's been gone for decades. 
I wouldn't want to invest in a company whose name rhymes with hemorrhoid. It's just not something I want to do. And the bubble of the 1920s caused the crash of 1929. You ever heard of Radio Corporation of America? Yes, you have. That's what was R that's what RCA stood for. RCA, the name lives on, the company's gone. Anyway, in the 1840s, there were 400 railroad firms. How many are there now? Less than five. And the granddaddy of all bubbles was the Dutch tulip bulb craze of the earth. D tulip bulbs were bought and sold like stocks? Yes, folks. We are not rational individuals. Read Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. What a great book. Written almost 200 years ago and yet talks about how nuts we are. Witch trials, the crusades, the picadillos in the investment world back then. None other than Sir Newton, Isaac Newton, would got caught up in one of them. And each time the phrase was, it's a new era, it's different this time. The tiled ways of valuing stock are gone, and each time they were wrong. Yeah, bubbles. And what happens after a bubble? A crash. Slide 11. What about taxes? Well, actually, stocks give you some really nice tax advantages because if you hold the stock for at least a year, a year in one day, then you get a much better tax rate. If you don't, then it's taxed as your income. But taxed as capital gains are taxed at a much lower, in, a much lower rate. And now, thanks to the Republicans, <laughs> dividends were traditionally taxed as income, but now they are taxed at that lower rate capital gains rate, which has been a huge windfall for the very wealthy. They know who their clients are. Slide no it helped me immensely. Slide number 12. What are some places where we buy stocks? Well, you could go to a traditional brokerage firm, but you know, more and more of them, they want you to now, it used to be they wanted you to have 50,000, then it was 100,000, then it's 500,000, and some are even more. So most of us go to the internet brokerage firms. You've heard of Schwab, you've heard of Robin Hood. <laughs> Some of them are offering free trades. Don't believe it. Well, sure, there's no commission, but they're charging you in another way. And we discussed this in detail in the 123 class, Introduction to Investments. And there are the low-cost options, such as DRIPS, Dividend Reinvestment Plans, which are very, very cool. Uh, they automatically reinvest your dividends into more shares of the company, something that you would want once you get involved in stock uh, investing for the long term. If you're a short-term trader, speculator, buy and sell, buy and sell, well, you're not interested in these things. And then you can actually buy your stocks in certificate form, but it, it's almost gone. The most popular was Disney. And if you go on the website, you'll see, you'll see why. They, they had these beautiful stock certificates. And people would buy one share just because they wanted the certificate to hang up on the wall. And Disney said, this is ridiculous. <laughs> so they, they got rid of them. But uh, if you're the kind of person who hides your money in the mattress, then sure, go buy your stocks in certificate form. They're actually now sold as, as like Beanie Babies. They're collector's items. Canceled ones, you know. like, like no, They're not worth anything other than the fact that people like to hang them on their wall. Hmm. Slide number 13. Okay, so now, mm, let's stretch. Mm, okay, got a few minutes to stretch ah, because we're going to discuss different types of stocks. Now, we hear people talk about the stock market as a whole. Uh, how's the market doing? But the truth is, folks, there are so many different companies and they're all, you know, some fit into some categories, some don't fit in any category, some fit into more than one category. And it's what I love about it is that it's it's a tremendous opportunity for learning. It's a lifelong learning process because there are thousands of companies that, and they all have their own story and some are boring and some are exciting and some are downright bizarre and cruel. But um, but so we're going to just take a look at a few of the uh, categories so that you can look at a company and say, oh, okay, I see that, I see that, I see that. And the, the, the safest and the strongest companies are called blue chip stocks. Now, where does that term come from? Well, 100 years ago or more, 120, 150 years ago, only gentlemen bought stocks. You know, 
hoi polloi didn't buy stocks but uh gentlemen also went to the gambling tables it's what a gentleman did and the blue chips were the most expensive chips on the gambling table i don't really like that <laughs> reference but that's what it's from. They're often referred to as value stocks. They attract conservative investors. It has nothing to do with politics, folks. Not, not conservative or liberal. It's talking about investors who want to invest in stocks but are worried about the stock going from $11.88 down to $0.30. Cents. And so the examples are General Electric, AT&T, and Coke. Well, General Electric used to be the bluest of the blues. It's kind of hitting on a hard time. Still has some businesses that are worth a whole lot of money, but it's nowhere near as monolithic as it was in the past. AT&T, some people are calling this the melting ice cube because although they have a very large business, they have to spend billions of dollars every year just to stay ahead of the technology because they go from the third generation, the fourth generation, the fifth generation, the sixth generation, the seventh generation, and every time people don't want the price to go up, but they have to spend billions of dollars. So at and uh, and Verizon are kind of biting their nails and wondering, what are we going to do? But Coca-Cola, yeah, right. Over how many times a day? It's gone down, but it used to be 400 people. Every, every, day, every year, people would drink almost one and a half or one and one and one quarter drinks of Coca-Cola in the United States. Mexico drinks even more. Fizzy sugar water with a brown crayon stuck in it. And what about some of the other blue chip companies? Yeah, think about the big companies. Yes, those are the blue chips. Income stocks are companies that pay, you buy them for their dividends. Uh, there's normally slow growth companies like a utility. Uh, utilities aren't growing. Some might be if the if the area they're in is growing. Uh, you know, fast-growing areas of the country. But typically, you know, they just sort of sit there and people don't want to take cold showers in the dark, so they, you know, they, they buy their gas and electric. And the utility pays out a lot of money in dividends. Banks are another one, although some of them are getting <laughs> in the news these days for making really stupid ideas, stupid things to do, stupid things that they did, stupid transactions. But banks are usually very boring and make a whole lot of money. How do you know banks making money? Their doors are open and they pay that out in dividends. Now, growth stocks are the stocks that are on the cover of GQ and Vogue and Vanity Unfair. And they have the beautiful teeth and the pecs and the $200 haircut. These are the companies that are growing at 15 to 20% or higher. They often have no dividends at all. Why? Because they're taking the money and reinvesting it back in the a company to grow. The stock price should go up as the business grows, but usually very volatile. So let's look at examples. Intel, HP, and Mike. Wait a minute. Are they still growth stocks? Well, HP has broken itself up, and it, you don't see too much about them anymore. They still make devices, and they still sell printers, although people complain about their printers printers biz <laughs> complain about their printers bitterly i do too intel is still holding its own although taiwan semiconductor manufacturing company is sort of dwarfing them and microsoft a wonderful example of a company that reinvented itself it has gone to the cloud and done very well so yes that part of the business is growing but what's eating into their into their business? Google Docs is free. <laughs> and they made most of their money off of Orifice. I'm sorry, um, Office with Microsoft Weird. Uh, worst word. Excuse. Expel, Excel and and uh, PowerPointless. Yeah. So now you don't have to pay. You just and so Microsoft is going, okay, well, let's see what we do. Well, they put everything in the cloud and and they're actually doing very well with that. Slide number 15. What are cyclical stocks? Cyclical stocks? These are companies that go around in a circle. No, no, no. These are companies that follow the business cycle of advances and declines in the economy. Any company that makes stuff like, like uh, materials and timber, steel, chemicals, automobiles are the poster child for cyclical companies. Because when the economy is doing really well, what do people do? Go out and buy a new car. Got a new job. Got a raise. What's wrong with the old car? I don't know. I like that new car smell. 
If the economy falls into a recession, do people go out and buy new cars? Oh, no. Bessie's just doing fine there. Thank you very much. And now chips have become part of the business cycle because as more stuff is made, it all has chips in it. On the other side of the coin from cyclical are defensive stocks. These are companies that remain stable, often do well when there's a decline in the economy. Why is that? Well, cereal and soap and toothpaste and toilet paper and drugs, <laughs> legal drugs. Do you buy more Cheerios or cornflakes and eat more Cheerios and cornflakes because the economy is doing well? Do you buy fewer Cheerios or cornflakes? Do you buy fewer rolls of toilet paper? And of course, you need your insulin, you take your insulin. So those are called defensive stocks. Not not they're not defense companies, you know, like companies that make bullets or stuff. No, these are called defensive companies. So when the economy falls, the people who are traders cycle out, rotate out, you might hear the word rotation, out of the cyclical companies into the defensive companies. See, that's that's if you want to be a trader. Good luck. And then speculative stocks. Uh, these are companies that are either going to explode and make you very, very wealthy or implode and make you very, very sad. One of them was called GoBroke. I'm sorry, a GoPro. Right, GoPro. <laughs> Go check out the, uh, I'm going to show you how to how do research, research stocks. Go check out the, uh, the graph of the, the chart of what happened to the, the price. Everybody was going to get on the bandwagon. Everybody's going to have a GoPro. Well, it turns out these things are really cool, but mostly people who are action-oriented, you know, sports enthusiasts, most people just use their cell phone for a camera. They don't need to put the cell phone on their helmet and jump out of an airplane. Uh, uh, Bluebird Bio, what do they do? Check it out. Very, very cool. And then we were talking about Stitch Fix and Twilio, some of these internet companies that are were highly valued until 2022 <laughs> and then the air started coming out of their bubbles stitch fix is actually pretty cool i mean i, I it's not i wouldn't buy their products but you you um um take i guess pictures of yourself or something make measurements and then upload them to their website and then they make the clothes just for you sounds cool i don't the stock has done poorly but you check it out <laughs> So uh, what about uh, some odds and ends? Turnaround stocks are companies that have fallen on hard times. You have to ask yourself, is there potential for a rebound? And so well, there are now several turnarounds in the tech world, and some of them are rebounding, and some of them might disappear. Chrysler in the early 80s almost disappeared, and then GM, Ford, and Chrysler after the Great Recession almost disappeared. They all came back, thankfully, or we would have lost millions of jobs in the United States. And then, uh, so I often call these guys goners because usually they don't come back. <laughs> That's the problem. Uh, asset plays are companies that are sitting on an asset that could be sold or spun off. So, for example, J.C. Penney's. Now, you think of them as a, as a, uh, a retail company, and that's what they are, and that's what they've been for over 100 years. But they also had an insurance division, and we know that insurance companies are like banks. They're making money if their doors are open. So they were able to sell that to raise cash to uh, keep the company afloat. So I don't know what they're going to do next because they're having a hard time. They're being hit from above by the uh, you know, boutique kind of places like Needless Markup. And, and, and they're getting hit from the bottom by the Targets and the Walmarts of the world. So they're having a tough time of it. And then we talked about the penny stocks, Butterfly.com, Flim Flam Incorporated, Blue Steam. It just stay away from these guys and see some examples on the website. So now that you have the basic categories under your belt, let's ask ourselves, what type of stock is Johnson & Johnson? It's been around for over what, 140 years now, I think. What do they do? You know what they make. Band-Aids, Q-tips, baby talcum powder and stuff. But they also make a whole lot of stuff. They make COVID vaccines and stents for your heart. They're a blue chip stock, right. And are they also a bit of a defensive stock because of the fact that they make health products? So, yeah. ExxonMobil? Well, yeah, they're a blue chip. They're very large. But what are they? Cyclical. Why? Because they make oil. 
And oil is the most, well, actually now people are saying computer chips are becoming more important than oil. But oil is the most important commodity in the world. Don't let anybody tell you any differently. And, um, and so when the demand for new goods and services are created, they need more oil for the inputs into those products and transportation costs and the like. And of course, when the economy is doing well, the cyclical companies do well. And when it's doing poorly, the cyclical companies get hit hard. What about Google? Well, I guess you call Google a blue chip company. It's one of the most uh, most profitable and one of the most uh, uh, valuable companies in the world. But it's a growth stock. And there's questions about how much more growth they're going to squeeze out of their business model. So we'll see. Because once a growth stock stops growing, right, the price just falls. The parachutes had better be very large. What about Sempra Energy? That's SDG&E, folks. That's the parent company. It's called Sempra, but everybody knows it as SDG&E. Well, they're not really a blue chip company. I mean, they're, they're one of the bigger utilities, but they're not actually one of the biggest utilities. Util oh, right. Utilities are income stocks. Right, exactly. And they're fairly defensive because most people don't want to take cold showers in the dark, but there's a bit of a cyclical nature to them, especially if the area they're in is more industrial, which we're not really. But um, but um, but yeah, we can think of them. Oh, oh, what else do we know about utilities? They're also sitting on a ton of land, so they're also asset play stocks, right? What about General Mills? What do they make? Cheerios, Wheaties. They're a blue chip stock, been around for over 100 years, and they're also defensive because food, right? You don't eat more Cheerios because the economy's doing well. You don't eat less Cheerios because the economy's doing well. How about International Paper? Again, another company that's been around for over 100 years, and it's a blue chip, but because they make paper, they also make timber because they're byproducts of each other. And that means materials, they're cyclical. Right, excellent. And they also got a lot of land, I think, a lot of minerals and the like. So they're a bit of an asset play. Union Pacific Railroad. Hmm, what do they do? Right, they transport stuff. So just like the people who make the stuff, they're also cyclical because they have to transport it to where it's you get raw materials to where they need to be uh, turned into finished goods, and then take the finished goods to where they need to be sold. They're also a NASET play because they're sitting on tons of land, a lot of it in downtown areas. That's where they wanted to build, <laughs> excuse me, where they wanted to build the, um, the downtown stadium. The Chargers wanted us to pay $2 billion to build, a, to build them a stadium. They were going to put it right downtown where the railroad is. And so the railroad was going to get paid very, very well. What about General Motors? Well, you know, for a while there, it was one of the largest corporations in the world. It's still doing okay, folks. In fact, they're, they're, they're duking it out in China. They sell more Buicks in China than they sell in the United States. So they're also a blue chip. But what do we know about companies that make stuff, especially cars? Very, very cyclical. When the economy's doing well, car companies make tons of money. And when the economy does poorly, they lose, they lose tons of money. It's a difficult business. Now, what about Flim Flam Incorporated? Who are they? Well, you know, they make those, those left-handed smoke shifters. They're, they're going to do better than the right-handed smoke shifters, which tend to do, set the house on fire. No, they're, it's, a, it's a penny stock. It's a sham corporation. It's somebody's garage out in Iowa or Idaho or one of those places that starts with the letter I. In fact, in the movie, uh, The Wolf of Wall Street, they actually showed one of these giant corporations. In, I think it was Iowa. I Iowa. <coughs> yeah, just somebody's garage with the name of a company on it. Stay away. And then General Dynamics. What do they do? Well, folks, they own NASCO, downtown San Diego. They're a defense contractor. And where do you put a defense contractor? Well, they're also a blue chip company, a very large company. They make aircraft carriers, <laughs> submarines. Um, it's kind of hard, right? They're not really cyclical in, the, in, the way, in that they follow the, the uh, business cycle. They follow the geopolitical cycle. And now that madman Putin has um, invaded Ukraine and 
many people said we st World War III has already started. I think the defense contractors are going to do very well over the next few years. What do you think? So what do you think? Excited? Interesting? Good, because that means you might have a career or become your own investment advisor. Boring? I can't stand this stuff. I'd rather eat barbed wire. Good. What? Well, not everybody wants to do this, folks. It's a lot of work. It's very exciting and, and, and fun and educational for those of us who enjoy it. And it is worse than boring. It's painful for people who hate it. And that's a good thing either way. Because that's why there are people in, in business to help you to do this, right? That's why we have financial advisors. We don't ask everybody to learn how to give themselves injections. And we don't ask everybody to, to do their own law lawyering. So just think about it. Analyze, we tell the people in the, one, in the students in the 123 class, analyze your emotions. Analyze your feelings as you're going through the, the exercises. And if you enjoy this, that's a very good sign. Because the industry needs you, folks. We are going to see a wave of old white guys like me retiring or dying. And we need more women. We need more bilingual, minorities, veterans. I'm serious. Okay, so are you excited? Oh, boy. Stick with us because there's a whole lot more. We are so proud of you folks. Think of how much you have learned. You are awesome.